Very good. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Jim Frame. I'm your medical director for Percom Online. I'm a board certified ER doctor and I'm also an attorney. I have been so for over 20 years and practice in medicine almost 30 years now. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, dilemmas that we have in the emergency department is talking not only to the field paramedics, but to take on patients that come in with complaints of lightheadedness and dizziness and palpitations. When these patients present to the emergency department, of course, they could be as benign as just feeling lightheaded and dizzy from medications, working in the environment, maybe a stressful event and such like that, or it can be malignant or as potentially fatal as a supraventricular tachycardia. And so the lecture that I'm going to give you on atrial and ventricular tachycardias over the next three weeks are gonna focus this week on the narrow complex tachycardias. Next week, we'll focus on the wide complex tachycardias. And then of course, we'll read the as and such the week after when we schedule. The paper that I passed out is an article that was written in a New England Journal of Medicine. And these are our board certification articles. They print about 15 of these a year and we're responsible for these articles. At the end of a 10-year cycle, we have almost 150 papers, um, which we're gonna be tested on to continue our board certification as ER doctors. And so one of the uh, challenges that you have here is an article that was just phenomenally written, and I've used it in another paramedic class as well, that has to do with these arrhythmias. Now, I have to ask, uh, again, you can type a Y or an N to see this article on evaluation initial treatment of supraventricular tachycardia. Okay. Looks like uh, you guys have, and I'm very pleased about that. The Each article comes with an evaluation by a couple of ER doctors who... Uh, our professors or associate professors or assistant professors, depending on where they are in their ranking, of uh, emergency medicine, their job is to review the articles and give you a synopsis. And so the key points and discussion that follow the synopsis gives an excellent summary in here about how to go about actually evaluating. And so the first thing we want to talk about is the patient that you hook up on a monitor all of a sudden you notice that they have a tachycardia. And that tachycardia is above 150. Now, sinus tachycardia is defined as anything 150 or less. Sinus tachycardias tend to be from stressful events, physiological events, maybe emotional events and such like that. And we're not really concerned about a sinus tachycardia so as they got a P wave before each QRS, the QRS is nice and narrow and the rate's less than one to deal with the underlying cause, which will bring down the heart rate. It's not too often that a patient will jump up into 150 like that as a sinus tachycardia. We're really dealing with rates that are over 150, but less than 200. Once you get over 200, you're getting into the atrial uh, multifocal tachycardias and such like that. And of course, uh, when they become wide complex, irregular, such you're getting into atrial fibrillation looking kind of stuff, ventricular uh, tachycardias and such. And that's stuff that we're gonna cover in another time uh, next week, hopefully. Today we focus on where's your decision tree? So you arrive on the scene, and I think the uh, article itself, the New England Journal of Medicine article, starts out with a 24-year-old woman who presents to the emergency department with sole symptoms of a racing heartbeat which began abruptly when she was eating dinner. You can read the rest of the story there um, on page seven, evaluation of initial supraventricular tachycardia. And as you go through it, you're gonna pick out a couple of things about it that we're gonna talk about. The first is that this was sudden onset. She's eating dinner and all of a sudden, boom, the heart rate starts. That signals one type of arrhythmia and that should be a trigger for you. You also notice that she's got an 84 over 60 blood pressure. So now you're thinking, is this stable or unstable? And then of course, uh, you show a uh, heart rate of 190, narrow complex tachycardia, which looks to be regular. How should the case be managed? So first decision, 
are the patient is the patient alert nor times four. If the patient is confused, malaise, 190 heart rate, blood pressure 84 over 60, and does not seem to be responding very well or having a lot of shortness of breath and difficulty breathing, these would be classified as an unstable tachycardia. And there's only one choice on. And if you would, Jamie, since uh, you and I have been chatting a little bit uh, during the week, tell me what's the one and only treatment for an unstable arrhythmia such as this tachycardia? Cardioversion, outstanding. How do you distinguish between cardioversion and defibrillation? All right, synchronize and not. For the, for the purposes of this discussion, that is a right on answer, and I like it. Do you synchronize your cardioversion? When you shock a person for synchronization, it's hitting right on when the QRS is hitting. That's at maximum depolarization, and you can cardiovert right out of there. Uh, defibrillation is, a, um, is when the ventricular fibrillation is present. Ventricular foci are firing all over the place, and your objective is just to shoot a lot of electricity across, stun everything, raise the electrical potentials, resets all cells at the same time, and hopefully the SA node comes back in and does its usual thing with the AV node, and the rest is history. Hopefully you get a conversion. I wish it was that simple. Cardioversion, on the other hand, uh, when the patient is unstable, uh, makes this a, uh, an easier thing to do. All you got to do is kind of sedate the patient. What distinguishes this case from a stable patient versus unstable is blood pressure is low. She's a 24-year-old woman, but we don't know if she's a thin 24-year-old or not. 84 over 60 could very well be her normal blood pressure. Or her normal pressure, blood pressure could be 100 over 60, and 84 over 60 is just a minor drop. So unless they have really profound shortness of breath and difficulty breathing, or if they're pale and diaphoretic, or good mental status, then an 84 over 60 in a conscious alert and oriented times three person with good skin color is just stable. The patient who's unstable is the one that's going to get the cardioversion. Okay, Jamie, nice job. So now we go to this. If you look at your monitor, run a 12 or a 15 second strip. You got plenty of paper in there. Run it for as long as you need to make a determination while your team is getting the 12 lead EKG hooked up. And you want to see if it's regular. Is there P waves that you can make out? If you can, fine. If you can't, fine. But our regular rhythm means just that. There's less than 10% variation from beat to beat. If you've got a truly regular rhythm, it should be falling on pretty much the same lines on the EKG strip as you go all the way along. And I think they uh, illustrate that very nicely on page uh, 10, where they're showing a um, slowing... Uh, tachycardias and such like that. Now, you're not looking at the bottom, but we're looking at the really the top rhythms and such. Even though they look pathological, you can have, um, with SD segments and such, the underlying rhythm, the first determination is whether or not it's regular or irregular. So, in this particular... Hello, Matthew. How are you doing? In this particular case, you set up the monitor, you look at it, is it regular, is it irregular? And then you take the algorithm down from there. Is it narrow complex or is it wide complex? Now, jumping back in, uh, Matthew, since you just joined us, I hate to tag you right away. 
but what is the acceptable range for a QRS depolarization? It goes from this amount of seconds to that amount of seconds. Uh, yeah, there you go, George and, and Matt. All right, let's see who gets the answer first. Yeah, perfect, George. Nice job. And a PR interval, right, Matthew? All right, so you guys, uh, the PR interval would be 0.12 to 0.20. All you I was looking for is what uh, Mr. Garcia had put down there, 0.04 to 0.12. And I said, oh, the cracker almost jumped in and jumped back out again. Come on, what are you going to say? Probably hit the button. Okay, fair enough. So now I want you to jump to page 14. At the top of page 14 on your article, you have a neural complex tachycardia. Let's say that the QRS interval is 0 0.10, okay? So we're neural complex tachycardia. This is your algorithm. If you were to blow this up and laminate it and stick it in your ambulance somewhere, I think you'd find yourself in very, very good shape. And you'll find that with the regular rhythms, Neural complex regular rhythms, the algorithm is pretty simple. In our story here of the 24 year old woman who was sitting at dinner and had sudden onset of palpitations, we're going to take the algorithm from neural complex tachycardia to regular rhythm, and then we're going to go to sudden onset. And we've got a couple of choices here. Do vagal maneuvers terminate? You know what? Out of 30 years of practice, I've seen it happen probably six or seven times. And this is back in the day in the 90s when we were actually putting people's face in cold water, which uh, didn't thrill a whole lot of patients uh, to death there, uh, sticking their face in water. They're already tachycardic from probably something. They're already upset over their situation. They feel stressed out. And, oh, by the way, here's a bucket of water. That's, that's a acceptable previous vagal maneuver. We try to be a little bit more sophisticated about these things. In the field, as field paramedics, I would encourage you all just to go ahead and start drawing up your adenosin as you are having the patient hold their breath and try to blow against the closed glottis or something along that lines. But you'll find that on your national registry test, vagal maneuvers or adenosine administration is going to be acceptable. Now, what happens after depends on your patient. In this particular case, if it terminates the rhythm, then it's probably an AV nodal reentry, an AV uh, reentry tachycardia, or atrial tachycardia. Uh, less frequently, you could have one of the other three uh, segments there if there's no termination. But the single most important thing to notice is that it's safe in most cases to give a denison for a narrow complex, sudden onset, regular rhythm tachycardia. Does anybody have any questions about that line along the algorithm? All right. All right. If nobody has any questions, just go ahead and put an N in there for each one and just send it real quick. Very good. Okay, Amanda, let's start studying this diagram a little bit and let's find out what we might have. Now, for a gradual onset tachycardia, in other words, a person during emotional distress, maybe physical stress outside, dehydration, um, just witnessed a car accident, maybe they've just been in a car accident, or maybe they've been hit in the chest real hard from an airbag, 
or some sort of chest trauma to them where you have a mild cardio contusion. Now, here's a caveat that I'm going to give you guys the answer to a National Registry question that's been on it since I think I started taking the registry exams in 1973. Here we go. The most common arrhythmia involved in chest myocardial contusion or lung contusions is sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia to be defined as a P wave before each QRS, a rate of 150 or less. If your patient has a bruised heart, a bruised lung, or a bruised chest wall, you can't expect a sinus tachycardia. If they've got another arrhythmia going on, trauma is not the cause of it, something else is going on. But in traumatic injuries to the chest, sinus tachycardia is gonna be the big one. When you guys get to the medical director interview for trauma, I'm gonna give you a scenario where a person has had some sort of event to their lung where they've got decreased breath sounds and a tracheal deviation. When you ask for the vital sign, you're gonna get a pulse rate between 130 and 150. Now that could be in response to shock, depending on the blood pressure, depending on how I feel that day and what blood pressure I give you. Or it could be the result of a myocardial contusion. So don't ever discount that and don't be in a hurry to cure a sinus tachycardia. So Amanda, going down the regular, the narrow complex tachycardia rhythm, algorithm, to the regular rhythm, down to gradual onset or sudden onset after trauma, you see sinus tachycardia in the next box. And the objective is to treat the underlying cause. So again, if the patient's dehydrated, since and such like that, Amanda, how would you, oh, okay. You don't know which article. Um, <clears throat> I sent out some articles on a 2015 lifelong learning assessment self-study guide. Did you receive that, Amanda? Gotcha. Jane, is there any way to do it right away? Oh, don't be sorry. It's, uh... And George doesn't have it either. Oh. You can pull it up and share it on the screen on your desktop using the features here. Let me see if I can get rid of this one. Uh, let me try that. Yeah, I was afraid of that because I noticed a couple of people coming in that weren't here last week. So they wouldn't have gotten the article that you emailed out to the group that was here last week. No worries. It'll Never be afraid off. to say something, Amanda. If you click on my documents and then it'll give you a chance to like find the document and bring it up on the screen, there's a, a you can pull it up from your computer there if you like. Or you can do it that way too. Might be easier if you click if, if you close out of that and click on uh, go back to where you've got that white screen and click on the my documents, and then you can pull up the whole article like I had that page. There's an X up there at the top. Your um, you know, on my document. Yeah, close this. There you go. Can you see that one? Yep. Can you see the algorithm now? Okay, good. And there a, I was afraid to say something. Be afraid. Man, this is, this is one of the things I insisted on. I caused Jane a lot of heartache by getting this all set up because I want to talk to you guys directly. And so... Um, she was all over it and she said, great. So this is, this is our doing. This is what we want to do for you guys from now on is have a Friday conference, a chit chat, but it has to be a two way exchange. If you chime in with your voice, that's fine. Most of us, um, 
prefer a conversation, but if you prefer typing it and such like that, that's perfectly fine too. Okay, so on the uh, on the rhythm, uh, let me give you a briefing real quick. Neural complex tachycardia is all we're going to talk about this week. Uh, we're going to talk about regular versus of this uh, at the very beginning. And I want you to just take a symptom of racing heart. So take a second, look that over and look at the strip there real quick. And then we'll start back again. Okay, so what we talked about before, a 24-year-old woman, a young woman whose only symptom is palpitations, a racing heart. She has prior episodes of palpitations that respond spontaneously, but today it has not. So she comes to the emergency room. Blood pressure is 84 over 60. EKG reveals regular narrow complex tachycardia rate of 190 without clear should the case manage. And so it really depends on whether your patient's stable or unstable. Uh, what we mentioned earlier was that you describe an unstable arrhythmia by the not only the blood pressure, but as the patient have altered mental status. Skin pale? Are they Are they looking like they're having tachypnea? Real distress signs. Altered mental status is the big one. In her particular case, she's got an 84 over 60 blood pressure. She could very well be a lightweight. She could be very small. And as a result, her normal blood pressure is maybe 90. So she's alert, she's awake, she's talking. She probably, well, she's not considered unstable. If she was unstable, your choices on the National Registry exam are going to give you a four of them, including defibrillation and cardioversion. Be careful that you choose the correct answer of cardioversion. It's easy to slip right down into defibrillation circle, and of course, it'll be wrong. You're not attempting to defibrillate this person. You just want to cardiovert them, no matter what their tachycardia is, if they're unstable. So that's the easy part. All right, back down to the algorithm. Like I said, go ahead and uh, laminate this one and stick it on the wall of the ambulance because this is, this is everything. So... We covered the sudden onset. This was sudden onset, and it's usually just uh, one of these rhythms on the bottom. Most of the time, it's what it's what they call a, a nodal reentry or a regular reentry tachycardia, and we'll go over that anatomy here in a second. Adenosine, the most important medication that you're going to have for neuroregular tachycardias. Now, sinus tachycardia goes up to 150. Thing over 150 is an atrial tachycardia. Yeah, or could be an AV nodal tachycardia, which is why we just give it big name, supraventricular tachycardia. And there's about six rhythms that fall underneath. It doesn't matter to you what um, what the name of it is, a regular atrial tachycardia. As you at this diagram, you can see that the SA node, the sinus atrial node sitting up here, can shoot an impulse down to the AV node and then down the bundle to the Purkinje system and then to the left. What they're describing here as a uh, atrial flutter, what happens is that the impulse comes out of the atrium and instead of going to the AV node, it circles around an accessory pathway and keeps coming up and down, up and down, and up and down, and around, in addition to the regular SA node. So there's a second node firing someplace here. And you can see that over here on an AV nodal reentry as well, where it just fires and keeps firing and going down the, the uh, Purkinje fibers. No matter where it's at, even on the 
antidromic and atrial tachycardias, you can kind of get a good feel here what's going on. It's supposed to go from the SA node to the AV node and down, but every once in a while it takes a shortcut or a short circuit, and it can start playing uh, quite a bit of games with the patient's heart rate. But no matter what it is, iplex tachycardia, it's going to be treated with a denison. My card. The protocol I'll call for just 12 milligrams being given off the bat. You can give up the three doses. Um, in very rare instances, if you're wrong, uh, you could throw the person into V fib. Um, but for the most part, a death. And last and only slow heart rate down, neurocomplex rhythm gets a denison. That's the easiest part of this whole thing. The regular rhythm down the right arm, uh, I'm sorry, left arm of this algorithm has to do with when the tachycardia starts. Gradual onset tachycardias or traumatic tachycardias else. It's very rare that a sinus tachycardia which is a rate less than 150, but greater than 100. It's very rare that a sinus tachycardia would just pick up on its own as a result of pathological heart. Something else happened. Emotional distress, medication, medication interaction, chest wall contusion, myocardial contusion, lung contusion are the most common causes. And of course, just pain response. If I fell down and broke my leg and I come in a, with a heart rate of 110, I wouldn't be rushing to get a denison into me. This is a physiological response to a stressor, whether it's real, whether it's uh, emotional or uh, psychogenic due to a, uh, whatever stressors that are out there that affect people this way. The algorithm is gradual onset. It'll be a sinus tachycardia, which is what's illustrated here on the ST. And you're going to treat the underlying cause. Now, in the National Registry exam, that's the way it's going to look. The patient just had mobile upset. Here's her rhythm strip. Her heart rate is 125 to 130. What's the treatment going to be? And they're going to list the denison, barat, amiodarone, and then the fourth one's going to be supportive care. And these patients get supportive care. All right. So a denison is good. If a denison doesn't work, then we start looking at other causes here, and we can get into that in a little bit. <clears throat> now, what happens when the patient is, and I want you to turn your attention now to this block that I'm looking at here. Verapamil and diltiazem, which is cardizem, also blocks the atrioventricular node the same way that the adenosine does, is therapeutically used in neurocomplex. Because hypertension is not the first choice in the emergency setting. Okay. So I want you to be careful of that. Make sure that adenosine is your first choice. Now, what happens when the patient has a neurocomplex tachycardia but it's irregular. So before I start on that, does anybody have any questions? If you do not have a question, press no. If you got a question, please ask the question here now. All right. All right, so now what happens when the neurocomplex tachycardia becomes Irregular. I'm going to turn the questions off for a second. If you have a question, to chime in with your voice right now, because I got this the uh, conversation box off on the lower part here. Irregular supraventricular tachycardia can be a result of the top one here, which is atrial fibrillation, or the bottom one, which is multifocal atrial tachycardia. So as you can tell, here's the SA node, this little yellow node that's down here. And you may have only three or four firing. 
That's multifocal atrial tachycardia. Now, for your National Registry exam, there's only two medications in an overdose form that will cause multifocal atrial tachycardia. And these are important for the National Registry. The number one is digoxin, and the second is theophylline. Fallen out of favor a bit, still used in certain circumstances to control rapid response atrial fibrillation when it has to do with a very irritable AV node. Digoxin actually kind of poisons the AV node and makes it slow down. But they'll ask you on the National Registry exam or you who's all of a sudden had some sort of palpitations, can't catch his breath, you listen to his lungs, hmm, he sounds suspiciously like... Um, it sounds suspiciously like he's having COPD, except you listen to him and he sounds pretty good and his pulse oximetry is actually 98%. So you start looking at the talk of the KG and when you pick up multifocal atrial tachycardia, what's the first question you're going to ask? Are you taking theophylline? Now, the question is asked on sepsis, is sepsis a cause of tachycardia? And the, and the answer is absolutely. Your mindset is perfectly right along where I want and need it to be. In that case, sinus tachycardia, and these patients are going to need uh, fluid challenge, obviously, uh, because they usually go hypotensive. Fluid challenge will fill up the system. Now, in sepsis, and we're going to get off on a tangent here for a second, put your, uh, put your mind at ease for a second. In sepsis, a gram-negative bacteria releases substances that, exotoxins, that cause dilation of the blood vessels. So even though you don't have a hemorrhage, and even though you don't through dehydration, six quart system to all of a sudden dilate the system that can accommodate seven or seven and a half quarts, or maybe even eight quarts. And so to compensate that so-called lower blood pressure because you don't have enough fluid to all of a sudden fill the system, the heart rate picks up. It's one of the first responses to hypomere hemorrhagic shock, septic shock such as that. And so you'd give a fl fluid bolus or two. But as you accurately pointed out on the chart, sinus tachycardia is you'll want to treat the underlying cause to get that fixed. If the patient starts showing over a rate of 150, it doesn't mean they need more fluids. It means something else is going on or as always happens in emergency medicine and field paramedics is that it's happening at the same time, something else is happening. So now you got two things to cure instead of one. But that was a very good, uh, very good uh, uh, problem to point out is that in sepsis, you do get sinus tachycardia. Okay, back to the uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Uh, we went to digoxin and You're going to see only three focus, maybe firing. You're going to see some different P waves looking and of course it's going to be irregular because as you can tell one is sitting way over here in the left atrium one is sitting real close to the e node and so they're going to have a shorter pr interval and one's going to have a little long one and of course they're firing erratically so the rate will be irregular as pointed out up here it'll be an irregular supraventricular tachycardia the treatment there for these patients is just to make sure that they don't get way out of control with their heart rate and then their uh, uh, blood pressure at all. We will have a, a discussion here in a moment on what medications we're going to use for these two. Now, multiple, multifocal atrial tachycardia is differentiated from atrial fibrillation, the AF one up here. We've got multiple foci firing at a rate between 300 and 400 per minute. They're all going to fire off and go to the AV node here. The AV node has a one-tenth of a second delay before it allows impulses to go down Kinji's system. So with 300 or 400 beats hitting them all at the same time, the AV node may very well accept between 150 and 200 of these at any time. 
If it goes higher than that, the patient definitely is unstable and there's only one treatment for an unstable supraventricular tachycardia, in this case, atrial fibrillation, and that's going to be... But let's say the patient comes in with the same rate, uh, just like the 24-year-old we had in here. You get called to the scene of a 60-year-old female presents to you with shortness of breath and difficulty breathing. You come in and you ask as long as they seem to be clear, there's no evidence of bilateral basal or rails. But you do notice on the 12 lead EKG that they have an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. So it can only be one of two things, atrial fib or multifocal atrial tachycardia. In the multifocal atrial tachycardia, you will see some semblance of a P wave and such, but the rate is going to be about 150 to 160. I've never seen a multifocal atrial tachycardia really over 160. Yet in atrial fibrillation, I can have a heart rates up to 220. So if the patient's stable, in other words, blood pressure's stable, the patient's alert and oriented times four, and the patient's not got any respiratory issues, shortness of breath, difficult to breathe, and they're not dropping their pulse oximetry, uh, these patients can be treated with, yeah, let's get back to that. Uh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Here we go. We're going to deal with heart rates greater than 150 right now. Uh, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with the varial block. Get the atrial flutter with varial block out of your mind. National Registry says you should learn it, but it doesn't show up on exam. Uh, atrial fibrillation is going to be the major, overwhelmingly, no kidding, 100% of the time, it's going to be atrial fib. Why? You can't see the P waves. It looks like a flat one going into the next QRS, a flat line going into the next QRS, and they're irregular. <coughs> now, let me ask you a question. I need a yes, no from everybody. Does everybody know what it means to march out QRSs? All right, yeah, go back to your monitor for a second. Let's take a look at this. If I take kg calibers, measure this distance to this distance to this distance, and then I measure the next four or five beats, and if it looked like they're nice and regular, they what they call is called marching out. It's like soldiers in a line. They march, 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 steps, Regular rhythm doesn't mean the rate's regular. It just means the rhythm is regular. There's no variation or very little variation between the two beats. Regular rhythm, which does not march out. This distance here, a little bit shorter than this distance. This one here, a little bit shorter than these over here, etc. And so atrial fibrillation in this particular case is classically irregularly irregular. And you have to have boards in there or else it's no fair. In other words, it's not the answer. If it's regularly irregular versus irregularly regular, that's a that's a different arrhythmia altogether. You're just going to deal with regularly irregular rhythm, which is going to be atrial And so back down. Greater than 150 beats per minute, patients. Now, the easy part, anything unstable, when it comes to kind of take a goal, what's the treatment? The treatment's going to be cardioversion. Piece of cake. That's probably the easiest thing that you know.
just like everything else, Matthew, just takes a little practice, work with the EKG calibers, and if you don't have one of those, then just take a piece of paper and mark where the QRSs fall on four beats, and then just piece of paper and see if those four beats, those lines, keep falling on top of the QRSs. Treatment for atrial fibrillation is going to be a beta blocker. You could use it, but here's the big one. Diltiazam, IV push. This is probably the best thing that we're going to Same challenge. That's what happened. Now you put them in a rhythm in a system, uh, high heart rate. Cardizem is the medication of choice, and that's going to be on your national registry exam. You can use a beta blockers. I like the ABCs of arrhythmias. Adenosine being a very safe medication. I'll give adenosine if I cannot distinguish between atrial flutter, atrial fib, or AV nodal reentry because the heart rate high. Let's say you get a heart rate of 200, 220, or something like that. It Heck, it's firing so fast if it's regular or irregular. I mean, it's just too fast. So I'll give adenosine or the B or the C, B being a beta blocker, C being a calcium channel blocker. So follow the ABCs of arrhythmias. If you got a regular rhythm or you don't, if you give beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, make sure it's irregular. Uh, you don't want to be slowing down a regular rhythm. So that's kind of the ABC. That's kind of the field treatment for uh, arrhythmias. Okay. So we covered regular and irregular arrhythmias here. Let me get back up to the, let's make sure we're not missing anything. Okay, very good. It looks like we got everything covered, uh, atrial rhythms. Now let's go up here to the anatomy a little bit and you can find out what happens in uh, AV nodal re-entries and such like that. Now, when I talk about AV nodal re-entries, it's just a fancy word for supraventricular tachycardias, which happen to be regular. So you can have an atrial flutter, which is exemplified up here in the left-hand corner, AV nodal re-entry, and then there's a couple of ways to determine if it's orthodromic, antidromic, or AVRT. Now, for those of you who don't have the article, um, I'll make sure that you get it over to you. But here's the orthic AVRT and antidromic AVRT. Notice on the diagram, the normal circular path that goes through the AV node, goes through the Purkinje up, and then it takes the shortcut, the accessory pathway, which isn't supposed to be there. And it comes back around again, and that impulse just keeps going round and round and round. But it's going back down to the ventricle, back up to the AV node. That is orthodromic. And in that particular case, this is what your EKG is going to look like. 
it's actually not going to look bad. And when you look at that, you go, well, why do I have to know orthodromic from uh, AV nodal entry tachycardia versus antidromic? And the answer is you don't, except it's kind of a curious thing to look at. As you trans into cardiology, as you start looking at these arrhythmias more and more, you're going to pick up more and more about it. With confidence that orthodromic and antidromic are not going to be tested on the national register. But when you do see these kind of arrhythmias, you have to wonder what's going on in the heart that's causing this to happen. And in both cases here, you can see here and you can see here, there's an accessory pathway. In other words, it's a short circuit. You've got the normal pathway from SA to AV and then down the path. These guys aren't supposed to be here, these shortcuts, but they do show up. And when they show up, your patients can get real tachycardic. So it's kind of cool to, to know it. Atrial tachycardia, it's in the bottom right here. There's one focus, the SA node, that can fire up to 150, 160, 180, 200 times a minute. But it's only one focus. It, it's not... All of them, like you saw in atrial fibrillation with a whole uh, atrium, uh, multiple focus on the left, multiple fo focus on the right, kept firing and firing and firing. Like I said, atrial fibrillation give you 300 to 400 atrial beats per minute, which is why it looks like a squiggly line of fibrillation, because that's all the atrium is doing. Now, atrial tachycardia will give you one focus, you a regular supraventricular tachycardia. All five of these are regular supraventricular tachycardias. So when you come back down to your algorithm, do I need to know if it's orthodromic, antidromic? Do I need to know if it's atrial tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and such like that? The answer is no, you don't. What you need to know is that it's neurocomplex, it's regular, it came on suddenly, and I'm gonna give a denison. Terminate, it's fine then you probably got one of these. If it doesn't turn, then that's usually when you get on the phone to one of us and we, in the neural complex tachycardia I'm going to make it real simple for you. The ABC I'm telling you about could be AABC. And that's going to be adenosine, amiodarone, beta blocker, whatever you're carrying, metoprolol or labetalol, and then C would be calcium channel blocker. Amiodarone is one of those safe medications as well in giving. However, next week, we're going to talk about some of the wide complex tachycardias, and when we do, you're going to find out, maybe I shouldn't be using amiodarone here. But for the sake of the narrow complex tachycardias, AA is going to be your answer 95% of the time. With the other 5%, tachycardia and you're going to treat the underlying cause all right does anybody have any questions about this very important but very straightforward regular narrow complex tachycardia Very good. As you can tell, the wide complex tachycardia is coming up are going to be this the next week. And so what I'd like you to do is to review the narrow complex tachycardia, regular versus irregular, and how you would treat that. And I want you to start looking over the algorithm chart for the wide complex tachycardia and decide how you're going to go about treating them. Now, as you can see in a wide complex, I'm just giving you a preview. We're not going to broach the subject today, but I just want you to learn how to start studying these out your memorization. You're going to see ventricular fibrillation. Okay, well, that's atrial fibrillation with Wolf Parkinson White. Okay, a little bit of that. Uh, atrial fibrillation or with benign WW. You're not going to see that on your National Registry exam. So I would eliminate that arm. 
But we're going to talk about all this stuff. And you're going to, as you come down, you're going to see procanamide, sodalol, lidocaine, or amiodarone. And I think most systems are carrying amiodarone now because it is such a safe medication to administer. You may ask, why don't we give it to everybody? Side effects, and the side effects can be deleterious. And so what I want you to do is read over the article and look over your arrhythmias. I can assure you that anything that you get on the exam from a car, the first decision again, the very first thing you're going to decide for me is whether it's wide or narrow. If it's narrow, it's here. If it's wide, it's here. And then you're going to determine if it's regular or if it's irregular. This is going to break this down. Again, you're regular, regular. We're going to break this down into just four components. Regular, irregular, narrow, or wide. And that's all you're going to need to know about cardiology. You can look at a gazillion strips, and with the exception of a systole, second, third degree heart blocks, and if you would. So... Does anybody have any questions before we end tonight's discussion? I try to keep these around 50 minutes to an hour to make sure that you keep your attention. It's not a lot of information, but it is going to be very fundamental information for you to understand how we go about in the emergency department or why we the orders that we do to you guys in the field for various tachycardias when you send us strips, patient's history and physical exam. Does anybody have any questions before call it a night? Okay. Uh, let's see what is next. Uh, Next Friday night is the 17th. I'll be here at 8 o'clock. And at that time, we will walk by the car. And again, it'll be a 50 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, where we will go over the algorithm and the medications associated with it. That sounds good to me. I'll be putting uh, this on to the uh, the video view, and I'll be posting the link for next week's, probably uh, in the afternoon or evening next week uh, beforehand, so that it doesn't get buried in the news feed. Sounds great, Jim. Thank sounds good. You much. And as I get better at this, I'll be able to throw some strips up. All right, guys, take care. See you.